open your Bibles, please, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Often at the beginning of an important book of literature or work of literature or even music, a writer or a composer, they will declare a theme at the very beginning, and then they will allow that theme to recur again and again throughout that book or throughout that composition. Authors will do that with maybe a visual image right at the beginning and let that recur again and again. Composers like Beethoven, they will bring in a definite musical motif right at the beginning and then introduce that again and again. Sometimes in literature, it's done by means of just a word or a concept as we have here in John's gospel. John's themes are light and life. Now I already focused on the theme of light a couple of weeks ago and so today I want to direct our attention to life. Basically the gospel of John begins and ends with this theme. I remind you that John begins by declaring in him, that is Jesus Christ, the Word, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And then all the way at the end in chapter 20, John concludes by saying, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. In his name. In John 14, 6, Jesus declares that he is the source of life. I quote Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 5, 40 shows that there were many, many men and women who refused to come to Jesus to find life. But then in John 10, 28, Jesus says of those who do come to him, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In all, the word life occurs more than 35 times in John's gospel. And then the related verb to live increases that total to more than 50 instances. But what does it mean to say that Jesus is the source of life or that he is the life? The first answer is that Jesus gave physical life. Jesus gave physical life. If it was not for the word, the Lord Jesus well, we wouldn't even be alive. And this takes us right back again to Genesis, to Jesus' role in giving life to every living thing and creature and anything that's alive in the world. You remember John's opening line, in the beginning, traces straight back to the Bible's opening sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When John wrote that the Word brought life, he was reminding us of the way God spoke in creation. Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. John takes us back to that very moment, and he says of the Lord Jesus Christ, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. So just putting it simply here, all physical life emanates from the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ. I like the way Arthur Pink says, Man, with all his boasting, is unable to bring into existence a single blade of, gra of grass. Isn't that something? Well, let's look specifically, though, at the life of humanity. Us, but Adam, our ancient father in particular, the first man. The account in Genesis continues, Genesis 2-7. The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Every term is crucial here. First is the word dust. We're told that God formed man from the dust of the ground. You know, mothers will tell their little boys, go take a bath. What's the typical response of a little boy when his mommy says, go take a bath? I'm talking a little bitty guy. 
I mean, let me just, I'll take you back to my childhood. I, I was never dirty. You know, go take a bath, Todd. I'm not dirty. You know, somebody should giggle. Did any mamas raise little boys or am I the only dirty little dude in the crowd here? You know, I'm not dirty. Yes, you are. You know, uh, look at that dirt on you. I have always felt like every little boy, and I wish I would have been a little better Bible scholar when I was a little boy. My mom's in the crowd. Here's what I would have told mama if I would have been a little more theologically astute, about four, five, six, seven years old, seventh, eighth grade, maybe tenth grade, I don't know. I've always felt the little boys should say, but mom, uh, this is just the dust of the earth that God made me from. It's just sort of showing through. I think that's a pretty good comeback. Dust kind of puts us in our place, doesn't it? It reminds me when Jesus also said that we're the salt of the earth. I've always wondered, why not diamonds? You know, why not gold and rubies and precious gems? In fact, if you skim the Bible and you stop at the high points uh, where God is just doing significant work in human history, you will observe that God almost always uses common elements and common people. Isn't that right? And he does that so that all the glory goes to him and none of it, none of it, to us men and women. We see this in God's choice of Abraham and Moses, David and the prophets, Mary and Joseph, John the Baptist, the disciples, on down the line. They were all ordinary people and God chose them for extraordinary purposes so that all the glory would go to him. We have this principle stated for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 where Paul writes, consider your calling, brothers. This is every single Christian, uh, brothers, but these are sisters too. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So when God formed men and women, he did not use gold. He didn't use silver or uranium or iron or platinum. He just used dust, a very common substance. And even though we are fearfully and wonderfully made, as the psalmist writes, all of the glory is God's and there is nothing in us that we can boast about. Donald Gray Barnhouse writes, So low is dust that God gave it to the serpent for food as his curse. It is to dust that all bodies return in death. Wow, I just want to say there are many, many practical lessons that dust carries that I would love to preach. Prideful people like us could stand to hear a lot of practical lessons about being dust. But I need to move on to the next word that John has in mind from Genesis 2-7. And that is the word breath. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It is the breath of God that makes the dust come alive. And what in the world is God's breath. It is that which comes out of his mouth. This is what it sounds like. Well, what is that? It is his Holy Spirit. It is his Spirit, which is always associated with his Word. His Word, his Spirit. It comes out of his mouth. You know, when we speak about these three different terms in English, breath, Spirit, and Word. I held up four fingers. I didn't learn to count very well. Breath, spirit, word, uh, they seem to be unrelated to us in English. That is not at all true in the Hebrew language. In Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament was written in, the same word is used for spirit and it is also used for breath. And it is the Hebrew word ruach. Ruach. When I say, if you were too close to me and I'd been eating onions, it'd be like, <laughs> you know, it even sounds breathy. Ruach. Ruach. That's spirit. That is breath in Hebrew. And what is more significant in Hebrew, the breath of God or the breath of people. Just our breath that is associated with the person's spoken words. When we speak, we breathe out our words. So here's what I'm saying. When we put all this together, we find this theological truth. I was going to put it on the board. God brought forth life in man by speaking the word of life which John has already identified for us as the Lord Jesus Christ, in such a way that the spirit of life, which is his Holy Spirit, passes into man and causes him to breathe. Let me reread that. 
God brought forth life in man by speaking the word of life in such a way that the spirit of life passes into man and causes him to breathe. So what is just the practical takeaway from this theological truth that John gives us here? It's just this, just simply. We are creatures and Christ is our creator. Just that simply. Christ exhales, we inhale, and therefore we live. And so just first and simply, Jesus Christ gives physical life. You are alive because Jesus Christ wanted you to be alive. He breathed, you inhaled, you are alive in Jesus Christ. Well, what else does it mean to say that Jesus is the source of life or that Jesus is the life? We just saw that it means that Jesus gives physical life. But really, that's just the groundwork that John is laying for the spiritual interpretation of life that John is going to unfold throughout the rest of his gospel. And as the book goes, goes on, John will just speak increasingly of spiritual life. So secondly, Jesus gives spiritual life. Jesus gives spiritual life. He's the source of physical life, but he's also the source of spiritual life, which is what we receive, it's what you receive when you believe in him. And let me just say to you, naturally speaking, you are as unresponsive to God as the dust was before God breathed his spirit into it. That is you and your natural. You are absolutely unresponsive to God. Could not care less about him. Apart from the gift of the spirit that God breathed into you, you are dead spiritually. And I say that because God says it. Consider Ephesians 2. The Apostle Paul reminds the Christians at the church in Ephesus that before God made them alive, they were dead spiritually. They were in rebellion against him. Let me just quote this wonderfully famous passage, Ephesians 2, where Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, it's one of the best buts in the world right there, but God, you can laugh, I kind of meant that like that. <laughs> But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, now get this, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow, what a past that verse describes and what a condition that verse describes. In our natural state, we can do nothing to improve ourselves spiritually. Apart from Jesus Christ, no one has breathed one breath towards God. Nobody. All this spirituality in our world today, all this seeking after whatever, nobody's breathing one breath towards God. No one has one spiritual heartbeat. Humankind is dead in sin. We need a new life and this is why we must be, what did we read John 3 16? We must be born again. That is exactly what we need. And being born again means receiving new life by faith in Jesus Christ. You remember Ezekiel? You remember when Ezekiel saw that, that, that valley of dead dry bones. God gave him that vision. Remember that? And there's just all these dead dry bones and God, God instructed the prophet Ezekiel to prophesy to the bones and you remember they began to come together miraculously. Let me just quote Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37. He writes and I looked and behold there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. And then God said to me Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. And what a remarkable illustration that Jesus gives physical life, but most importantly, he gives spiritual life because that's what Ezekiel's vision is all about here. It is being, about being born again spiritually. And we know that because that's what God said at the end of that vision when he applied that vision he gave you, Ezekiel, to every single person, including, I hope, you, who would become born again. Ezekiel 37, 14, where God says, I will put my spirit breath 
within you, O oh man and woman of dust, spiritually dead, deserving of nothing but my wrath, but I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. That's spiritual life. We have right there, by the way, that Hebrew wordplay on ruach again. Breath, spirit. You are dead spiritually. Apart from the life-giving breath of the Lord, you must be born again. You must be born again. Now let me clarify something here. Being dead spiritually, which we all were before being born again, that does not imply that all of us were in an identical state of corruption. Now follow me here. In fact, let me quote let me quote a wonderful old author. Harry Ironside wrote a book called Genesis. And he points out three instances in the life of Christ, as you just follow him through the Gospels, that illustrate this point, that when we were all dead in our sins, we were not all in an equal state of corruption. Let me read here. The beautiful little maid, the daughter of Jairus, had been dead only a few minutes when the blessed Lord reached her father's house. But she was dead. and She was lifeless. Fair to look upon, lovely and sweet, no doubt, in the eyes of her beloved parents, like a beautiful marble statue. But although there was not a corruption that, not, that might have been, she was dead nevertheless. Turn over to Luke's gospel and you will find that as the, as the blessed Lord came to the village of Nain, they were carrying a young man out to bury him. He was dead. Dead perhaps a day or two. This young man was dead longer than the little maid, but life was just as truly extinct in her case as in his. Then you have the blessed Lord at the grave of Lazarus. The sisters told him not to roll the stone away, for their brother had been dead four days and would already be offensive. Corruption had set in, but the Lord Jesus brought new life to that man as well as to the others. And here's how Ironside concludes. In the same way. We are all genuinely dead apart from the life-giving spirit of Jesus Christ. There may be degrees of corruption, so that relatively speaking, some men are far less offensive than others, but all men are dead spiritually. All need the divine life. And I just apply that by saying to you again, you must be born again. I don't care how good you think you are. Uh, in fact, I even wonder, how do you rate yourself, morally speaking? Because it is inevitable that we are prone to fall into that temptation to rank and rate ourselves among each other when it comes to ethics and morality. We all seem to use this sliding scale by which we compare ourselves against each other. And most people, I've noticed, will give themselves a pass by saying things like, well, I'm not an axe murderer. Uh, I'm not a serial rapist. I'm not Hitler. I'm not as bad as the criminal thugs I read about on the news. No, I'm not perfect. And I love people always say, that I'm not perfect, you know, but the err is human, right? Wrong. To err is to be dead spiritually. To err is to rebel against God's right to rule you. I have unsaved friends who are literally better people than a whole lot of Christians I know. You ever met people like that? They're just like Jairus' daughter. Their natural goodness makes them appear as if they are actually alive. Oh, they are dead. Absolutely, they are the walking dead, spiritually speaking, because the Lord Jesus Christ has not yet breathed the spiritual life of the Spirit into them. I just ask you, have you repented of your sins and, and believed in Jesus Christ alone for salvation? I'm asking, are you born again? Or are you still dead in your sins? Are you dead in your sins? Well, there's one more truth that we need to notice before we conclude. The life that Jesus gives, gives is not merely earthly life, physically, physical life, uh, or a life of such quality that it can be lost. Because Jesus gives, thirdly and finally, eternal life. He gives eternal life. It, it can never be lost, right? The spiritual life that you started living the day you got saved, that's the same life that you will be living with God in eternity, unending millions of years from now. It is that life. And what is eternal life? It's life without end. That means it's the life of God because he is eternal. And if it could be, let me just say this, if it could be lost, as many church people think is the case, case then it would not be what? Eternal life. Isn't it just strikingly simple that it is called eternal 
life. John declares with certainty in his first epistle, 1 John 5, 11, and this is the testimony, God has given us what? Eternal life. You know, not maybe, not for a little bit if you're good enough, not something you could lose, just says it right like it is, eternal life. And this life is in his son. It is all because of Jesus Christ. You are justified by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. It is all of him. It is not of you. That is the beautiful gospel that just frees you and rescues you. So God has given us eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to close with this. He has also given us a life that is meant to be an abundant life, even right now. Abundant life. Jesus once said in John 10, 10, the thief, thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it, what? Abundantly. Unfortunately, many Christians have eternal life. They do not have life abundant. In fact, I think there are many believers that would describe their lives as anything but abundant. More often than not, I think we tend to wander through life kind of wondering what it's all about. What's going on? Just lost and confused. And I just want to tell you that is not how God meant your life to be. That's not how he meant it to be. God does not want his children living miserable lives, always confused, always questioning, always complaining. And let me give just three quick suggestions that will help you live life abundantly. First, read prayerfully and meditate carefully on scripture. Read it prayerfully and meditate carefully. You will never ever experience the abundant life Jesus promised if you do not become a student of the Word of God. It is impossible for me to overstate the importance of regular Bible study. Now to be sure, let me just be honest, you will not get a spiritual high, talk about the hands in the air, you will not get a spiritual high every time you read the Bible. So come on, be real. Uh, don't expect that. You will have seasons in your life when you don't feel a thing when you read the Bible. Still, the abundant life is inevitably connected with faithful Bible reading. That is to say, even when you don't perceive it to be working. You know, we, we Americans are pragmatic. We want to see measurable, tangible results. And if we don't see it, well, it's not working. It's not efficient. No, no, no. They are inextricably connected, inevitably connected. So even when you perceive your Bible reading and study to not be working, God's Word is always changing you every time you read it. You know, it's kind of similar to flying on an airplane. You know, you get on the airplane, you know, and you're all in there. And it used to be a flight attendant that came forward. It seems like now it's just all on a video. And they give you all the instructions. You remember that? The flight attendant explains that in case of an emergency, what will deploy? What will drop just magically out of the ceiling? What is it? The oxygen mask. And you've been on a plane. What's the next part? We're told, now don't worry if you don't see the little yellow bag inflating. Isn't that funny? They know we'd be scared, you know. Because oxygen, they tell us, is still flowing. Thankfully, I've not had to put that to the test. I don't even really know if that's true or not. That's what they're telling us. Oxygen is still flowing even if it doesn't look like it. Scripture is a whole lot like those little oxygen masks on the airplane. Life is flowing even when you don't see it while you're reading. You just have to trust that it is. And so your part, what, what do you do? So your part, keep reading, keep praying, keep thinking about the Word of God. Thinking, that brings me to meditation. It's a lost art today among Christians in America because we live such frantic, breakneck lifestyles. Now, let me say this, meditating on Scripture, I'm not talking about sitting in the lotus position, eyes closed and chanting, oh, you know, we're not talking about that. Uh, that kind of godless meditation, really, that's meant to empty your mind in order to achieve oneness with the universe. That is the very opposite of what Scripture means when it calls us to meditate on God's Word day and night, Psalm 1-2. Meditating on the Bible is like, it's kind of like the opposite of worrying. Don't raise your hand, but every single one of us not. Man, you, we've got theological experts on worrying here. We know how to worry, don't we? Now think about worrying. Here's what you do when you worry. Man, when you worry about something... You think it through. You have anal you're laying there on your bed in the middle of the night. Think it's like you're turning it like a prism. You want to go to sleep, but maybe you don't. And you're just you're turning it, and you think about it from this way. You think about it from that way. Oh, what's going to happen here? You know, 
What are you doing? You're meditating your worry. You know, you're turning it and thinking. You're considering all the possible outcomes. You're contemplating all your responses. And here's what I'll do and here's what I'll say. And you're just turning it. By contrast, biblical meditation means doing exactly what you do when you worry, only with the Bible. So here's what I mean. Take a verse. Take a passage, whatever it is. Read it. Think it through. Turn it. Ask yourself, what's that teaching me? What's it teaching me about God? What is that teaching me about Jesus Christ? What's that teaching me about creation? What's that teaching me about sin? What's that teaching me about temptation? On Whatever it is. And then say, and is it calling me to do anything? Is it calling me to believe something? Or is it calling me to, exhorting me to do something? And then step back at it and look at it from a different standpoint. Take some time with it. You know, take some time with it. So put simply, biblical meditation just means thinking hard and often about the Bible. That's what it is. And you can do that. You don't need a seminary degree to do that. If you can read or even just listen to the Bible on tape, you can do that. As you engage, here's the whole point of this, as you engage in that time-honored practice, you will begin to experience abundant life. Second, what can you do to begin living life abundantly? Worship Jesus with his people. Worship Jesus with his people. It goes without saying the Bible prioritizes worship for these two reasons, at the very least. The first is the example of Jesus himself. You know, Jesus ministered publicly. Well, how many years, Bible scholars? How many years did Jesus engage in his public ministry? Yeah, about three years, right? What was he doing for the 30 years before that? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was working and living and worshiping in this obscure backwater village named Nazareth just as part of the big old giant Roman Empire. That means for about 30 years, Jesus went to the synagogue every week of his life. Just like you do, week in, week out. That's where he was. And at least for me, when I consider Jesus, we're talking Jesus, when I consider him getting up, Going to work every day, sweating, just going through his week, going through his life, and then taking a day off to worship God. I'm kind of floored by that. We're talking about the Son of God who was in the beginning, was God, was with God, spoke everything into existence. He's God in the flesh, and yet every week of his life he went to some little old dusty first century synagogue in Nazareth and prayed and sang songs, and listened to boring sermons, kind of like mine, from the Old Testament every week of his life. And I'll just say this simply. If worship with God's people marked Jesus Christ's life, oh my goodness, who are we to think that it should not mark ours? Every week like clockwork. Be here. Be here. The Bible prioritizes worship for another reason. In heaven, corporate worship has priority. Every time. Man, when you open up the Bible's pictures of heaven, and you just, everybody wants to know what's heaven going to be like, well, it gives us some glimpses. And every time we are given a glimpse, the whole host of the redeemed are worshiping together. And I thought about that, and it reminded me of when Jesus taught us that one of our consistent prayers should be, this is from Matthew 6.10, I quote, God's will, we should pray, that God's will will be done on earth just as it is where? In heaven. What are they going to be doing in heaven? What are they doing in heaven right now, by the way? Worshiping together. God, I pray that your will will be done here just as it's being done there. And so one of the ways that that prayer is answered is just by worshiping Jesus here with his people. And so if you want to experience the abundant life that God promised, make worshiping with the Lord's people your main priority. Third and finally, how can you begin living life abundantly? Serve in the power that Jesus supplies. Serve in the power Jesus supplies. You know, spiritual life is sort of an enigma. It's a weird thing. When you begin to serve someone in the name of Jesus, well, not only do they receive a blessing, I can promise you this. You will discover in the process, because service is just hard work. You know, it's not about you. It's about somebody else, and they're going to get the blessing. But here's what's crazy, the enigmatic part of it. You will begin to live life more abundantly as a result of that. Here's two quick tips for serving. First, regain control of your schedule. Regain control of your schedule. 
I don't think God intended us for us to intended for us to live these crazy busy lives, of constant errands, constant appointments, constant practices, constant overwork. On a, that does not fit the life of the Lord Jesus, who is the perfect example of what it is to be a human being. If you think you've got a good idea of what a good life is, your bucket list, if that does not mirror the life of Christ, then you're completely wrong. Christ came to show us exactly what life is. If you want to know what the abundant life is, look at the life of Christ. I don't think God intended us to live these crazy, busy lives where we don't have a moment to serve somebody else. Regain control of your schedule. Second tip, stop multitasking. Stop multitasking. Research, in fact, indicates that multitasking actually makes us less, not more, productive. So you think about that. If your most important relationship, the one that you're supposed to have with your Heavenly Father, if that requires your total focus, well, then it just makes sense that who else requires that? What else? Your, your human relationships. Multitasking kind of diminishes your ability to listen to people to devote yourself to becoming a student of other people. And as a result of that, you will find yourself never beginning, getting beyond the surface in your relationships with God and with other people. You can't, loneliness is it's epidemic. You know, we're talking a lot about COVID-19. Oh my goodness, nothing compared to loneliness in our culture. It's growing by leaps and bounds. People don't know how to go beyond the surface they're so inward turned and selfish turned and it's a neurotic kind of a thing and the end result are just lonely depressed people you can't concentrate because you can't go deep so you don't know your heavenly father well and you don't know other people well but God certainly wants you to go deep with him and with other people and the only way that's going to happen is when you learn that doing a whole bunch of things runs the risk of having the important things not receive your full attention now, obviously, there are going to be times when you've got to multitask. Man, there's just times where crazy things are happening. I guess what I'm advocating is that a life of distracted multitasking should not be the norm for a Christian. The abundant life is a life of focused Bible study, worshiping Jesus with his people, and serving in the power that Jesus supplies. And there are no hacks or shortcuts to that. There's just no quick, quick hit shortcut to a profound, abundant life with God. It takes time and it takes constant concentration. You know, in fact, a common theme that kind of weaves its way through these su suggestions is just the call to dependence. Dependence. Every American, it seems, is trying to look like an individual who has it all together, just crushing it every day. It's like a weird American thing. We just want to be, I'm on top of the world. Everything's great here. No problems here. Man, just crushing it every day. I think God wants something different than for us to just all be high achievers. God's goal and design for our lives is that we might learn through all the painful experiences, all the failed dreams, all the relational disappointments, all the suffering, and a host of other means, God wants us to learn that the abundant life comes when we learn to depend on him. So as we totally conclude today, let me just remind you that Jesus Christ gives physical life, spiritual life, and eternal life. Now you're alive physically, obviously, or you wouldn't be here. You've got a heartbeat. That's because of Jesus Christ. But maybe you've never been born again. You've never repented of your sins and placed your belief in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Why not be born again today? Why not receive the gift that is breathed out from God, His Holy Spirit, who will breathe new, abundant, eternal life into you? Why not do that today? Please stand to your feet. God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave us life, who came to do everything necessary to give us spiritual life, New life in Christ, being born again. And we thank you for the promise of eternal life with you in heaven. That we can begin enjoying abundantly even now through your spirit. And Lord, we just pray that based on these great truths about Jesus' as life, that as you look into the hearts of every person here today, comparing their heart against your word, 
We pray, Lord, that you will move each of us to respond exactly as you want, exactly as you are telling us. Everyone here knows exactly what they need to do today. And I pray, Lord, that you will just give them the courage to heed your call. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.